So today, our message title is Dead to Die No More. Perfect for baptism. <laughs> That's right. Amen. Hi, everybody. My name is Pastor Leslie. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus. Amen. 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 What's up? <laughs> if you come to CR, you know what that's all about. So good. God is moving. And we are crazy enough to believe that this county belongs to Jesus. Amen. Amen. Come on. It does not belong to the enemy. This is not his ground. Especially because you holy believers live here. Come on. This is our territory. Let that sink in. This is our ground. So wherever you live, wherever you call home, that is your place where heaven reigns, not hell. You are in Christ. You carry the kingdom. He said the kingdom has been birthed within you. It's now here. Not out here. He didn't come to rule and reign as a military leader. He came to put the kingdom inside each and every one of us. So that nothing can stop the advancement of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Nothing can stop him. Boy, two people believe that. Nothing can stop him. Last week we talked about Christ in you. When you say yes to Jesus, you're not just saved to just have a mediocre, okay life. You are placed in heavenly places. You are moving from glory to glory. Amen? Amen. That is such a beautiful way to think about what Jesus does in us. We feel like we're not moving anywhere. We're moving from glory. Because he's in you, and he is your glory, to glory, because you're moving in him, and you move from glory to glory. If the enemy is lying to you and saying you're a failure, and you're moving from failure to failure, and he's trying to put shame on you, or guilt and condemnation on you, that is not the Father's voice, and that is not who you are. Tell him to stop talking. That was my nice way of putting it. I wanted to say something else. Crush his head. <laughs> Woo! In Galatians 2.20 it says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Amen. Oh, that's good news. The dead man's dead. He's deader than dead. He's dead, dead, dead. Verses 1 through 14. You know, we say Christ in you, the hope of glory. But the question I always get is, what does that mean? How do I do this? Who am I really? Yeah? Why do I still struggle? You guys ever ask those questions? Okay, I want to read to you, Romans, just to affirm the fact that you are fully alive in Christ. I want to read this passage to you. But I want to encourage you to go home. I want you to read Romans chapter 5. I want you to read Romans chapter 6. I want you to read Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 8. If you want to know who you are, this book is so full of truth. Look here. Don't look anywhere else. If you want to know who you are, look to the Word of God. And this is what the Word says you are. The title of this section says, Dead to Sin, Alive to God. What shall we say then? Paul is asking. Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. He's kind of being a little sarcastic. I should have read that a little more sarcastic. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Oh. How can we who have died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that 
that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. I have resurrection power living on the inside. God's not a far off distant God. He is right here. This is what the Word says. This isn't Leslie Travis' great idea. This is the scripture. This is the very words of God. It is very active and very living and pierces through all the lies. Amen? Amen. For if we have been united with Him in death like this, like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection life like his. We think, well, we killed off the old man, but now you are resurrected to life. That's right. Not to stay in the struggle, not to stay in, in, in the grip of Satan's hands. You are resurrected into a new glory and a new freedom. Amen? Amen. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. So that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Amen. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Come on. Dead to die no more. He died once and for all for sin. He paid the price and it is finished. You don't have to keep paying for it. You don't have to keep paying for the sin. It's paid for. It's finished. I used this example last week. It's like mom making a really good dinner and the kids coming in and she's saying dinner's ready. And they're getting out the pots and pans and getting out more food and starting to cook dinner. And she's like, it's finished. I got it ready. It's on the table. And they're getting more food out of the fridge and they're trying to make dinner and it's ready. It's finished. You are saved. You are free from sin. You are free indeed. It is finished. Period. No if, ands, or buts. <laughs> no buts. Okay. <laughs> For the <laughs> Verse 10. For the death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Dead to sin. Right. Not sitting in the grave. <laughs> Come on. You ain't in the grave next to the dead sin. You're out of the grave. You are free indeed. Get out of the grave. Don't sit in there. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you. That's right. Since you are under, not under the law, but under grace. Does sin have dominion over you anymore? No. Some of you believe me. I felt a little bit of like, huh? But I, but I still, but, but it has no dominion over you. It's dead. Dead, dead, dead. Deader than dead. Do you get it? Sin is dead. The old man is dead. I don't want to smell him. We talked about that last week. I don't want to stir that up. Come on, get out of here. I am done with you. Sin is not suppressed by the cross. It is eliminated. Ooh. Somebody just got free. It is eliminated. It is not suppressed and pushed down. The old man is not still hiding in there somewhere. It is eliminated. You are free indeed. No matter what the enemy tries to lie, because he wants to shame and guilt you back into the death, but you're alive. Sin, you are dead to me. Can you say that? Sin, you are dead to me. Ooh. So I think Leslie would agree 
that we have probably not experienced as much spiritual resistance in warfare in preparing a message as we ever had than is this one. And this week has been crazy. And we have just felt the enemy. And we know it's because he is terrified. He is terrified of the truth of the gospel. He is terrified of the church stepping into her true identity as sons and daughters, as victorious warriors. Those who walk in divine health, he's terrified. And there were people throughout the week who were praying for us and receiving, and they didn't even know what was going on. But we found out later that the Holy Spirit was stirring them to intercede on our behalf because we were going through it this week, and especially yesterday. And we're so thankful for many of you who we talked to and we texted, and you came alongside of us and you lifted us up. And you, um, on our behalf, claimed victory yes. Yes. and silenced the enemy. Amen. Right. Amen. And this message is life-giving. And can I preface what I'm about to share with you by saying this? My understanding is limited. There may be something that I say today that you come and ask me about. And I'll be honest enough to tell you, you know what? I don't fully understand it, but I know it's important. And so I'm going to say it with all confidence and authority, even though, because listen, we're not called to understand. We're called to have faith. Understanding comes from faith. By faith, we understand. And if it's in the Word, whether I fully understand it or not, I may never fully understand it, but it's the truth, and I'm going to stand upon the truth, and I'm not going to waver, because the Word is my foundation. Nothing else. But sin, the verb, like you are sinning, the action, twice. Sin, the noun, a person, a place, or a thing, 46 times. Why is that significant? Because sin is a personality. Sin is an independent power. Finds expository Bible dictionary define sin as a governing principle or power. It's not just the actions that you do. It is a person. It is a being, an independent force that is coming against your identity in Christ, that wants to steal, kill, and destroy from you. Sin is an external personified force. But most of the time, we believe when we have an issue with sin, it's an internal issue. That sin is coming from the inside. That as Christians, we, feel, we still feel as though we have some sin still living on the inside of us. It's internal. And because of that, Jesus is at a distance. He's external. Because sin is still inside of me. It's an internal reality. And because of that, Jesus, uh, He's unattainable, truly. He's unreachable. What He's calling me to do, Jesus says, be perfect as I am perfect. Hmm. You think you'll never be perfect. Well, it's all a matter of perspective, really. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. We have been made new, reborn. You have been born again, body, soul, and spirit. Grace has done an incredible work in your entire being. You are new. You are new. You are new. All of you. Our natural desire to sin, call it whatever you want, the sin nature, the flesh, the old man, doesn't matter what you term it, has been co-crucified with Christ. That's what the Bible says. Your old nature is dead on that cross. You're not powerful enough to resurrect it. 
It has been crucified with Jesus. It is dead. You don't have a sin nature anymore. You, the, the old man has no influence on your life anymore. We are new creations now. Free from a sinful nature. However, the entity of sin still is in the world. It comes from the outside and challenges us with thoughts and desires for sin that are not ours. Everyone look at the screens. We have to understand this today. You are a new creation now. You are free from a sinful nature now. But the entity of sin is still in the world. And it comes though now, since we are new, creation sin is now no longer internal, but an external force that challenges us with thoughts and desires that are not ours. We still have the ability and the capacity to choose sin. Even though we are righteous, even though we have been redeemed and made new, we still have the ability to sin, to choose sin, just like we did before. Ask Adam and Eve. There was no sin in them. They were perfectly righteous, created in the image of God. But yet, because they believed a lie and were deceived, sin reigned in their mortal body. We still have the ability and capacity to choose sin by believing the lies and deception of the enemy. But it does not originate from us as believers. It does not come from our sin nature. In church, we have power over it. I feel like about three of you are with me. And I know this is, it's different. It's a different perspective. And I feel like the more we study this and the more understanding we come to, I feel like we're being born again and again. Because this is the truth. This is the gospel. I'm tired of living a with a defeated mindset. Come on, that's right. So, here we go. First reference to sin in Scripture. Genesis 4, verse 7. God is speaking to Cain. And God says these words. If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Look at that verse. Where is sin? It's outside. It's crouching at the door. Let me ask you a question, church. Who's in charge of the door? We are. We have the power to determine whether we open the door or not to sin. If sin is just a doing word, if sin is just a verb, it's something, it's an action, it's something you do, how does it crouch at the door? How does it have desires that are contrary to mine? If it's just a doing word. Sin is an external personified force. Sin is a person. I love how the King James Version puts this. Look at the screen. Sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Mm. Very good. Sin, the person, an external reality. Romans 6, 12, let's jump back to Romans chapter 6. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its Passions. Whose passions? Whose evil desires? Sin. Paul's saying, do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies. You have been made new. You crucified that sin with Christ. Stop believing the lies and the deception and allowing sin to reign in your mortal body. What does that look like? What does it look like to have sin reigning in your mortal body? Listen to this story. Imagine there was a young lady named Stacy, who for many years had an abusive, manipulative husband. She lived trying to please him, but he was never happy with her. He did not let her leave the house much, and he made her feel as if she had no value. He was controlling, manipulative, and very negative. 
Her behavior was dictated by his broken conclusions of who she was. After living this way for such a long time, Stacy could hardly remember what normal relationships were supposed to be like. She felt stifled, like she was no longer herself, yet was afraid to leave because of what her husband might do to her. One day, Stacy's husband wrote her a horrible, accusatory suicide note, his final attempt to rule her life. He then took his life. A sad illustration of something similar happened to a friend of a friend. Now you would think Stacy would have come out of this season and moved on in freedom, no longer at the mercy of this terrible deceived man. However, she still rarely went out of the house. She still behaved as though she was carefully trying to please her husband. She was no longer married to him, but he continued, but she continued behaving like she was. She lived as though she were walking on eggshells, compulsively keeping the house immaculate, cooking his favorite meals, and still believing as if she had no value. Her husband was reigning in her moral body, determining her actions, her day-to-day -day life, even though he no longer had authority or power in her life. This is what it is like to let sin reign in your moral body. When sinful desires the accusations and thoughts dictate your actions and your thought life. They are reigning in your body. This does not mean you take on a sinful nature again. It means you have let the things that Jesus delivered you from have a say in your life again and produce sin. Hmm. You are dead to sin. It no longer has any authority in your body. The enemy has been silenced. But we can still believe his lies in his deceptions and live as though sin still had power over us when we have been made new we are no longer alive in sin we are dead to it Amen. but we can live and let it reign in our bodies when we don't understand our identity who we truly are and the power that we truly carry in Christ I said this before God would never, ever call you to do something he would not empower you to do. That would be cruel. That would be God just teasing you. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, you can do it, you can do it, and then let you fall. And that is not his nature. No. And when Paul says, do not let sin reign in your royal bodies as believers in Christ, we have the authority and power to say sin no more. Amen. I'm not believing the lies. I'm not believing the deception. You have no influence over my life, over my thoughts, over my behaviors. You are dead in Jesus' name. You don't have to sin. Listen. It is not an inevitable daily reality that you're going to sin. I've heard that said so many times. I've said that so many times. I go, I'm going to fail today, I know. I'm imperfect. I live in an imperfect world, and I'm going to mess up. I'm going to screw up. I'm going to sin. That would be like, you know, uh, a football team walking out onto the field completely defeated before they even start the football game. And they say, we're, no, we're not even going to play because we know that we're going to, somebody's going to fumble, somebody's going to throw an interception, someone's going to get called, you know, a penalty, and because things might happen, we're not even going to walk out onto that field knowing we can win this game. Like they're the Dallas Cowboys or somebody. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about football team needing revival right there. It's in the Bible. We need to stop waking up and living in a, in a defeated mentality. That we are just sinners saved by grace. Yes. Listen, that is the most unbiblical thing. We're reading this book by Chris Gore. And he said for years and years at his church, they offered a thousand dollars. If somebody could show them in scripture where you are a sinner saved by grace. And they have not had to give anyone a thousand dollars because that is from the enemy. That you are sinners saved by grace. You are saints 
saved by grace. You are no longer a sinner. You can't find it in there. But because of our experience and what we've been taught for years and years and years, that becomes who we believe that we are. And it's more than just semantics. If you live as a sinner saved by grace, sin will be inevitable for you. You will not have power over it. It just becomes a nice philosophy. But you have all authority Jesus has given you. The keys of the kingdom. And the gates of hell will not prevail against you. Satan can bring anything he wants at you, but as a child of God, he has nothing on you. He can't. He's powerless. All he can do is lie. I'm stealing some of what Leslie's going to say, so I'm going to move on. <laughs> our problem is our experience has been our God. My prayer hasn't been answered. Things haven't happened the way I wanted it to. I believe that it didn't happen. The world is going to hell in a handbasket, so we just explain the truth away. Because of our experience. We cannot allow our experience to dictate the truth of the Word of God. We stand on it and we move in it, no matter our experience. Don't create a theology around your experience. Create your theology around the Word. Amen. If sin reigns in my life, it's because I let it. If sin reigns in my life, it's because I let it. I have power over it. And this isn't a boastful or, you know, I'm not bragging. This is who I am. And I'm secure and formed in that identity. It's who you are. You are free and empowered. And man, you know what, guys? Leslie and I, we're not afraid of just pastoring a church who knows who they are and who's powerful and who goes out and who changes the world. Yeah, come on. Yes. That doesn't intimidate us like all... Man, you know, uh, we're, we're going to keep people in bondage because we don't want them, you know, looking better than us. Good gravy. No one even has to know our names. Come on. It doesn't matter. Yes. We want you to become the church to the fullest potential of what Jesus paid for you to be. Yes. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, freely go receive, freely give. Stop keeping it inside of you. Ephesians 6, I'm almost done. Ephesians 6, 11, I'm going to We took the clock off the back wall, so I'm kind of lost now. <laughs> That's every person's worst nightmare going to church, right? Oh, they took the clock off the back wall. We're going to be here forever. <laughs> oh, man. Ephesians 6, verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God. That you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Listen to me. If sin, if your battle with sin is internal, why are you putting armor on? Come on. Right. Good boy. Come on. Are you trying to contain the battle? No. It's so that you can use, see, the armor of God is your identity. Help us, salvation, breastplate of righteousness, uh, shield, of faith. shield of faith, sword of the spirit, belt of truth, uh, shoes of the gospel of peace. It's your identity. It's who you are. Yes. And you can destroy the fiery darts of the enemy with the word of God. Amen. The fiery darts of the enemy are coming at you from the outside. It's not from within. Right? right. Sin. It's not an internal battle. You have no sin within you. The Word of God says, we're going to preach this next week because we're going to keep going in this. But by one man's disobedience, all were made sinners. But by one man's obedience, many were made righteous. You cannot be a sinner and be righteous at the same time. And in Christ, you are the righteousness of God. Raised up and seated in heavenly places. Amen. Amen. There's no sin within you as a child of God. But if the devil cannot control you from the inside, he will try everything to deceive you from the outside. And you use the, the word of God, the sword of the spirit, to defend 
and to extinguish the fiery darts of the enemy. Amen. You can live completely free from sin. That is good news. Yeah. That is the gospel of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Drop the mic. <laughs> Woo. Oh wait, there's more. Just a little bit. I'm telling you, Jesus isn't coming back for a weak church. He's coming back for a glorious bride. Come on. A glorious bride. A victorious bride. Not one hiding in her basement. Hmm. You are called. You are commissioned. You are co-resurrected with Christ to bring life to someone else. That's what I love about Celebrate Recovery. Because we get to do life together and we get to see the redeeming power of Jesus pull people out of darkness into the marvelous light and then be a part of a family and a community that says, you go higher. I'm calling you higher. Yes. Yes. Glory to glory. Yes. Yes. You see, the enemy is out to steal our that's what the battle is about. He doesn't want you to know who you are. He doesn't want you to know that you're a son. He doesn't want you to know that you're a daughter, that you're co-heirs with Christ, that you are the righteousness of Christ, that you are holy. Be holy as I am holy. Be perfect as I am perfect. If he is holy, then we are holy. He wants a holy church. He wants a righteous church. Amen. Sin has no place in this house. We shut the door. You see, when Jesus went into the water to be baptized, just days later, he was in the desert being tempted by the devil. He went through temptation just like we go through temptation. It's crouching at the door, right? Jesus was tempted just like we are tempted. Did he open the door? No. Days before he was tempted... The Father from heaven, when he was baptized, leaned down and said, You are my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So before he went into the battle of temptation with the enemy, he knew who he was. He didn't waver in his identity. He knew he is the blood. Oh, but that's Jesus. No, as he is, so are we in this world. So if he can stand and shut the door to the enemy and stand in his identity, then so can we. We are not weak. By the way, when you say yes to Jesus, you have a new family tree. That's right. John 1, 12 through 13. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, listen, nor of the will of the flesh. You can't will it. Nor of the will of man. No one else can save you. You are born of God. Amen. That last part. But of God. You can't make yourself saved. You can't make yourself good enough. You can't redeem yourself. He paid the price. The complete and finished work on the cross. Sure. You have a new family tree. You are born of God. Your generation line does not go very far. God is your father. No more generational curses in your family line. That's right. That's right. No. That's right. And you are born again. You are born into a new family line. The line of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the King, David, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. He's in us. And we have a brand new family. Look around. These are your brothers and sisters. Your grandfather's addiction is not your addiction. Christ severed the generational curses. You are co-crucified with Jesus. Your father is God. The enemy gets you to buy into that lie, expose the lie, and walk in the truth. That is not who I am. Sure. That is not who my son will be. That is not who my daughter will be. It ends here. It ends now in Jesus' name. what? Yes. God is on the inside. Sin is on the outside. Matthew 16, Jesus has given us all authority over the enemy, not partial authority. He gave us the keys to the kingdom. All authority is given to you. These are his words, not ours. When Adam ate from the garden, he gave his dominion to the devil, who then offered it to Jesus, who now Jesus gives it to us because at the cross he went and got the keys back and he said, the keys are yours. Amen. Take ground for my kingdom. The enemy has no authority. So when he lies to you, 
the only power he has is when you believe it. Believing the lie empowers the liar. If you hear any other voice than love, mercy, grace, joy, peace, patience, kindness, calling you who you are, if you hear any other voice, it is not the Father's voice. Shut it down. Do not believe the lie. Do not let him in. We have the mind of Christ. Another scripture I love. You have been given his mind instantly. You are redeemed. You are bought with a price. There's so much. Okay. We do not have to spend our lives fighting to resist a desire he has set us free from. When we put on the armor of God, the temptation loses all power. When you're in the middle of a fight, it doesn't feel like that. But I want you to know that you stand righteous. Just because you're tempted doesn't mean that you are sinful. Come on. He's got us believing that if we're tempted, then I am shameful, I am full of guilt, so I may as well do the action, I may as well conceive with sin, and go ahead and walk in it, because that's who I am, it's not who you are anymore. Amen. We are not defined by what we do, but by who he says we are. Yeah. Hear this church, we are not defined by what we do, but who he says we are. We've made our walk with Christ about how good we can be, how righteous we can be, how pure we can be. It's not about that. We will naturally become righteous. We will naturally become pure. Sin will not have power anymore. When you go into intimacy with Christ, He takes it all. It's gone. It's outside. You don't fall in and out of righteousness. You fall into righteousness. You don't have to react in anger. You don't have to go back to that alcohol. You 